We have a small operation here called Zona Libre, which is uh, derived from the fact that uh, Latin America was the first nuclear weapon-free zone in the world, and it's headquartered here in Mexico City. Um, we have many ideas of what to do, but uh, being short on resources, uh, we have decided to focus on uh, nuclear risk reduction. And I'd like to parse that uh, a bit because it's a very broad concept. Uh, and I, the first uh, distinction I'd like to make when it comes to risk reduction is um, risks that are associated with the technical aspects of operating such a dangerous thing as a nuclear weapons arsenal. Um, and there are a whole bunch of factors in that, uh, preventing unauthorized use of nuclear weapons, uh, preventing accidents, preventing um, theft, uh, and so on. And uh, those fall in this way of analyzing things under um, uh, technical challenges once you have a nuclear arsenal. Another, the other aspect, uh, and the one that I would like to focus on, is um, what is the, what, how do the policies that are adopted increase the risks associated with those nuclear arsenals? Um, these nuclear arsenals didn't just come into existence for the hell of it. Uh, they were guided uh, by policy considerations as to how the weapons would be deployed, how threats would be articulated, and how, if the uh, circumstances arose, they would be intentionally used. Now, just to give one example of how these two sides of risk reduction relate to each other, um, take the uh, issue of launch on warning. Now, um, launch on warning uh, is a policy. And it is, and it says that because some of our weapons are vulnerable uh, to be, <clears throat> to attack, um, we need to be ready to use them um, before the attack can be fully uh, realized against us. In other words, before the incoming attack missiles can actually prevent us from retaliating with our weapons. Okay, there are a lot of reasons why it's a terrible policy, um, and there are a lot of reasons uh, uh, how, how some of the nuclear weapon states got trapped or allowed themselves to be trapped in that policy, and uh, why they don't have the willpower at this time to extricate themselves from that policy. But that policy creates incredible technical challenges. How do you detect an attack before it hits? How do you, uh, how can you be sure that you've detected it? And once you've detected it, how do you go about uh, the launch and command uh, operations to realize the policy of getting your missiles out before the incoming attack occurs? Those are all huge technical questions. All of them create immense risks. Um, and peace activists uh, obviously are concerned to see that those technical challenges are met within this context. But in policy terms, we want to see launch on warning abandoned and dropped. And we would also very much like to see uh, that weapons that are vulnerable to preemption are in fact eliminated so that the temptation of uh, striking early is that much more reduced. So that's a connection between the technical aspects and the um, policy aspects. Now, when we look at the policy aspects, the thing that I want to focus on and which I really urge the peace movement as a whole to give much closer attention to, um, not to say that there isn't attention being given to it already and it's growing, I'll, I'll talk about that later, but, um, and that is that many countries 
uh, retain the option of initiating nuclear war. Now, what form does that option take? There are three basic forms. Um, and this is in the paper that I uh, uh, made available for this conference. And, and maybe Alan can just flash it up for a moment so, so that you'll recognize it. It has a funny name. It's called OK Then. I'll explain that. But uh, uh, basically, there are three um, uh, areas where uh, first use or uh, initiating nuclear war uh, are at, um, could play a role. And one is um, a strike out of the blue, a bolt from the blue. And that is that a country looks at the global situation and says, it's now or never. We either take out the enemy now or the enemy will overwhelm us at some later date. It's, it's a, um, yeah, you can see it there on the screen now, the, the ones with the dash, the three dashes there. Um, this, of course, is a um, disgusting, I mean, it's, it, it, one would be as a, as a loss of words to describe how criminal and, and obscene such a, an attack would be. Um, and yet, um, there is constant speculation as to whether this or that country may or may not be achieving a capacity, if not the intent, at the capacity to um, uh, make such a, an attack. Okay, the second one is that uh, in the course of a serious crisis, one or the other of the adversaries uh, begins to have questions as to whether the, their opponent might not be aiming for a st first strike. This is, uh, in uh, Hollywood terms, this is uh, the showdown at the OK Corral, where, where, where two guys are standing opposite each other with their hands quivering over their guns, uh, wondering whether they should uh, strike, you know, shoot first or try to see if they could survive shooting second. It's a, it's a situation which could very easily um, flip over into a nuclear exchange. Um, the third um, uh, situation is uh, where there is a uh, conventional conflict going on. And uh, in general, it would be the uh, country that is starting to um, lose or, or is in, you know, seeing the tide turning against them in the conflict might be tempted to escalate to nuclear warfare in the hope that the adversary will back off. Um, so these are the three uh, situations where starting a nuclear war could come up. And the options of doing this have not been renounced by most of the nuclear weapon states. We have the honorable exceptions of India and China. Ever since they um, acquired nuclear weapons potential, they have made it a clear policy that they would never be the ones to initiate nuclear war. They would never use nuclear weapons first. Now, let me just do a, a, a quick digression here. Um, most people are very familiar with the phrase, no first use. Um, most people are not familiar with the concept of never starting nuclear war. They're, in one sense, they're equivalent. Uh, but I would like to encourage people um, to resist the ease of saying no first use and try to discipline yourselves to talk about never starting nuclear war. Now, why is this? Well, first of all, when you get into first use and second use, you're entirely within the paradigm of nuclear deterrence. And um, our movement and the world as a whole um, has varied opinions about nuclear deterrence, um, and for good reasons. Uh, and so if you talk only about no first use, you're pretty much uh, right from the get-go, excluding people who have a 
proper moral um, uh, abhorrence of nuclear weapons and the thought of them ever being used, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, is completely unacceptable to them. Um, on the other hand, we have people who have become, unfortunately, very um, accustomed to um, seeing and relying on deterrence as a way of uh, preventing nuclear war and, uh, which, uh, and, and conventional war, which I will get talk a little bit more uh, about very soon. But by saying never starting nuclear war, um, you can set aside, you're setting aside what would happen if, some, if someone it did actually start nuclear war. You're setting aside that question as to, well, what is the proper response? And um, of course, the deterrence um, uh, theory says that it, there has to be a retaliation. Um, I would point out that deterrence theory is only acceptable if it never fails. If, the, if it fails and nuclear weapons are used, then nuclear deterrence theory is no longer a guidance as to what you should do because it's a failed policy. I would say don't retaliate or find another way of dealing with the situation. But retaliating is not going to be uh, a good solution. But other people, before the fact of the failure of deterrence, want to say, okay, um, we have a retaliatory cap capability and you have to worry about that. Okay, now back to, um, the, uh, back to the question of why talk about never starting a nuclear war? First of all, I think it's the Achilles heel of uh, the way deterrence is practiced in the world today. As I said, uh, most of the nuclear weapon states reserve the right to actually start nuclear war. But I think most citizens, most everyday people, think we only have nuclear weapons in order to avoid being attacked by nuclear weapons. And when they learn that we actually are threatening to start nuclear war, a, they get confused. What's, what's this all about? But secondly, they have a very visceral reaction, which is that cannot be a good idea. That must be a really bad idea. Um, and so um, the governments have gotten away with this uh, for a lot of reasons. And, and I, I'll just to mention one is I, I think we've been far too focused on the type of weapons, the number of weapons, where they're deployed, and so on and so forth. And we haven't talked about the policy guiding why we got these weapons, why we put them where we do, and what we intend to do with them. So uh, this, I'm suggesting that at least this, the, that your busy brains, you would <laughs> make a little bit of room uh, in your daily work, in your weekly work or monthly work, to bring up this question. And, and to uh, uh, work with others, uh, uh, both in your own countries and internationally, to make this happen. And that gets me to what I'd like to announce, which is that um, the Risk Reduction um, Working Group of Abolition 2000 um, has um, agreed to establish a special uh, listserv uh, internet communications uh, cap uh, capability uh, to bring together people who would like to make not starting, never starting nuclear war a facet of their work and to benefit by exchanging experiences, um, argumentation, uh, uh, all, all natures of uh, work that would allow us to be more effective in each of our countries, but also to use the fact that there is activism and progress being made on this issue in other parts of the world to bolster our efforts um, at home. So uh, I will be moderating that network. Um, and we're going to sort of try to keep it going for three, four years to see how far we can move with this. 
Um, I recognize that there are uh, several political challenges uh, to doing this, and I'll mention just one at this point. Um, there is underway at this time a very important effort to bring the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons into force. And it would be really wonderful if that could be achieved um, by the NPT Review Conference in 2020 or soon thereafter. Um, I do not want to see any work in any area uh, interfering with that accomplishment. Um, and so we need to be careful to judge whether there is a, a serious chance of a specific country uh, signing and then ratifying the uh, uh, ban treaty, um, in which case we do not want to create a um, less demanding option for that government to sort of cling to instead of doing uh, the uh, ban treaty. But in some, in some countries, it's quite clear that between now and 2021, there is essentially zero chance of um, that country, uh, a particular country, signing the uh, TN, uh, the, the ban treaty. And so uh, in those countries, uh, I think we have, have no problem going full steam ahead, pushing uh, for never starting nuclear war. Um, Enough at this point. Um, I'm sure there, this raises questions, perhaps even disagreements, um, and I hope uh, that we can have a little time to go into that a bit uh, before this session ends. And thank you, Tony and Alan, so much for organizing this.